interesting things to things tonight. Yeah, ready to go. Public's watching. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Crawley Borough Council's first ever virtual cabinet meeting, coming to you live from our own homes. Uh, for those of you who've not attended a cabinet before, uh, the council has far too much business that it couldn't transact on a day-to-day -day business if everyone was voting on every issue. So instead, we delegate particular sets of responsibilities to different groups of people, and we as a cabinet meet to take some slightly bigger ones before a lot of them go on to the full council. Uh, this meeting usually is a meeting that's held in public, which anyone can attend uh, and ask any questions they might want to ask at those meetings. Uh, unfortunately, through the limits of technology, we're not able to give that opportunity to people today, but we are providing you with live coverage of the meeting. Uh, and if you wish to raise any questions about the items today, please do get in touch with either myself or any other members of the Council's Cabinet. Um, it is, of course, also possible for you to watch this live and it would be videotaped and put onto the Council's YouTube channel as a permanent record of the decisions that we've taken and the reasons why we've taken them on your behalf. And I know that the press and the public can still hear us and I know several members of our local press who have for some years wanted to be able to avoid having to make the arduous trek across the county uh, to be able to be at these meetings when they've got other meetings to also attend and hopefully we can continue to enable that uh, once this is all over. Um, for any community meeting that's held virtually, all voting will be taken via a recorded vote run by the Democratic Services team member. Uh, and while most of the members attending this uh, meeting today are councillors, we are supported by a number of members of council staff who are there to provide experts, their expertise and their support in us coming to our decisions. Uh, all voting will be held via a recorded vote taken by a Democratic Services team member on behalf of the chair, whereby individual councillors will be asked at the end of the debate to say if they are for or against or wish to abstain the recommendation before them at that time. The exception to this will be the approving of the minutes from the previous meeting or any other procedural item where the item's sole recommendation to a committee is to note the report. For those items, the chair will move the item and it'll be presumed agreed unless a dissenting member from any committee member is from any committee is made. When asked to speak, please turn your camera on, unmute yourselves and pause for three seconds to allow the slight delay in camera connection. Uh, before I invite my cabinet to confirm their attendance, I ask that they please ensure their mobile phones are switched off or on silent, their backgrounds are obscured to avoid uh, their surroundings being shown, uh, and that any noise in the available area is turned off. Uh, in respect of items one to three, we'll be taking these items together, and I will ask the Democratic Services Manager supporting the meeting tonight uh, to introduce themselves. We'll then move on to apologies for absence. Chris. Chris, your microphone's off. You're talking to me. Good, e good evening. Oh, that, um, Chris. Chris Pedlow, Democratic Services Manager. Um, I will be now inviting cabinet members to, to confirm their name, their portfolio title, their, the ward they represent, their, any di disclosures of interest, and also to confirm their uh, approval minutes from the 11th of March. We'll start with Councillor Irvine. Uh, yes, Councillor Irvine, I'm, I'm here. Am I live? Yes. OK, um, Cabinet Member for Housing, um, representing Broadfield, and I have no uh, interest to declare. Councillor Lamb. Uh, Peter Lamb, I'm the leader of Crawley Borough Council and Ward Member for Northgate and West Green, and I have no interest to declare. Councillor Johans. Hi, Councillor Johns here, um, Cabinet Member for Environmental Services and Sustainability and Ward Member for Northgate and West Green and can have no disclosures of interest. And approve the minutes. Councillor Mullins. Uh, there we go. Yes, I'm Chris Mullins, Councillor for Broadfield and Gossip Green, Broadfield North East and Gossip Green. I have no um, interest to declare. Councillor Peter Smith. 
I'm Peter Smith, Ward Member for Ifield and Ifield West. I'm the Cabinet Member for Planning and Economic Development and the Deputy Leader. I have no interest to declare on this agenda and I approve the previous minutes. Chair, for public record, there is also Councillor Crow, Councillor Ron and Councillor Burrett who are also on, um, also in presence at this meeting. And Councillor Brenda Smith, cabinet, uh, a cabinet member, has sent her apologies for the meeting. Uh, can I then take it and people can simply uh, nod their approval? Um, well, actually, we probably have to formally go through it. Um, if you can turn in your order pack to the minutes, pages 5 to 16. Uh, is there anything anyone wishes to raise with uh, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page 10, page 11, page 12, page 13, page 14, or page 15? No. Can I then take it that that is agreed? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Second half. Agreed. 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 Thank Agreed. you. Uh, that brings us on to what would have been public question time, but of course we're unable to take that this week, unfortunately. Uh, but do make sure if you have any questions, you do write to us alternatively. Once we're back meeting in the town hall, come along to a meeting and ask your question. Uh, item five is further notification of intention to conduct business in private and notifications of any representations. Uh, while the vast majority of decisions taken by the council are taken in uh, public view, there are some items which due to largely the council spending money uh, and potentially if those uh, decisions were on the public record as to what we'd be willing to spend, it prejudicing actions being taken by the council to try and do things to safeguard the public purse. Some items are occasionally with help in the public agenda. This week's, uh, on this week's cabinet meeting, uh, there was a report called Appointment for a Supplier for the Implementation and Support of the Fully Integrated Housing and Asset Management Database System, which the Council is proposing to hold in private in order to not prejudice those discussions. We have received no representations that uh, people wish that not to be held uh, in private. Uh, are there any representations now? No one is indicating, in which case that will be held over once on the end of this meeting uh, to be held in private. Um, item six is matters referred to the cabinet by any report from the chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Commission. The Overview and Scrutiny Commission is a committee of backbench councillors who will look at a range of paperwork making its way through the council in order to provide their comments to the cabinet when the cabinet come to take their decisions. A number of reports on today's agenda have been before the Overview and Scrutiny Commission and I'll be asking the chair of the commission to go through the recommendations from that committee as we reach each of those reports. Which brings on to item seven, Treasury Management Outturn for 2019-2020. At any one moment in time, the council has significant assets on its, uh, on its books, significant amounts of money in its accounts. The council's Treasury Management Strategy um, sets out how those will be invested over the course of the year in order to ensure the council has security for that money, that it's able to get that money when it's required, and that it generates the greatest return for taxpayers in order to minimise the burden on council tax. The report set in front of us is the Treasury Management Outturn for 2019-2020, setting out how the council has approached those investing that money over the course of the past year. This report asks that we approve the action and prudential Treasury indicators set out in the report, that we note the Treasury Management Report for 2019-2020. As this is a fairly standard report that comes before us every year, and there's no uh, key issues that I uh, can see to flag up in it, it falling within my portfolio. Um, there's nothing I really wish to add at this stage other than to say that the report is a matter of public record. If anyone wants to go have a look, they can see exactly where the council's money has been invested over the last year, which is taken in line with an ethical investment policy that the council uh, has adopted in the past and which recently updated for issues relating to climate change. Um, as this report went to the Obian Scrutiny Commission, I'd now like to call in Councillor Tahir Irana to give us the view of those members. Um, thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. So it'd be, um, I'm just doing the comments and the recommendations of a Treasury man Management Outturn 2019 and 2020. 
the Commission considered report FIN 502 of the Head of Corporate Finance. During the discussion, the following points were expressed. Acknowledgement that all funds were managed internally. Clarification offered on the maturity structure together with number of detailed holdings. Confirmation provided that the major repairs reserve reduction had been spent throughout the year on capital spend, mostly on new council to dwellings. In terms of income generation and creative investments, it was in acknowledged that investments were restricted as the council was governed by CIFPA and the government. The strategy, the strategy strategy prioritize, prioritizes investments according, accordingly was providing an appropriate balance between security, liquid, liquidity, yield and ethical considerations. Explanations were sought and obtained on the details provided within appendices. Recognitions that investment properties were evaluated annually and the praise were classed as non-operational properties, along with others with a similar description within the portfolio. So the matter was resolved that Commission notes the report and request that the views expressed during the debate are fed back to the Cabinet through the Commission's comment sheet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'd now like to open up the discussion uh, to any members of the cabinet who wish to comment on this report. Please indicate using the, the chat function. No? I can say that certainly the council has continued to provide uh, or produce a, you know, a decent return for what money it has available to invest. Uh, that has all been used to offset the cost of services. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are still limited by the fact that council's income keeps going down and that is reflected in the money that we have available to invest. Um, in which case, if there's no one who does wish to speak, I'll hand over to Chris to do a roll call of the cabinet. Councillor Irvine, please confirm your vote on the recommendations on page 17 regarding Treasury management. Four. Councillor Lamb. Four. Councillor Chahans. Four. Councillor Mullins. Oh, below me. Uh, four. And Councillor Peter Smith. Four. Chair, that was unanimous in, um, to approval. Excellent. In which case we will move on to the next item. Uh, the next item is the Financial Outturn 2019-2020 Budget Monitoring Quarter 4. Each year in February the Council sets a budget and each quarter of the year uh, we receive a report outlining how the Council's expenditure has been reflected within that budget. Uh, this is the final report from last year's budget and summarises where the Council was up to uh, at the end of March of this year. Um, for those who cannot see the report, um, essentially the council has ended favourably at the end of the year against our budget with a surplus on what we had anticipated spending of £245,000. Unfortunately, very shortly after this report was issued, uh, the COVID-19 uh, lockdown has subsequently resulted in the council having a budget gap uh, emerge of £4 million. That's on a budget of £14 million. And so far, we've received grant funding is around one thousand, uh, sort of around one million uh, two hundred thousand pounds. Consequently, while this report does show the council in a favourable position, the forthcoming budget year we're being forced to act with a two point eight million pound deficit in our funding for the forthcoming year. In addition to noting the outturn for this year, uh, we are also agreed to agree a supplementary capital estimate of fifteen hundred pounds funded from Section 106 contributions, the Ewhurst Road play area, as outlined in paragraph 8.15 of this report, uh, and to retrospectively approve a transfer of 1.192 to the business rates equalisation reserve, as outlined in paragraph 9.2. The proposal to allocate money to the play area comes out of a pot called Section 106 funding. This is funding that the council receives uh, whenever a new development goes through and is allocated for particular purposes. 
the money in this case has been assigned to only being possible to spend on leisure uses uh, within a particular area. Consequently, we're being asked to allocate some of the money that can only be spent on these activities towards enhancing this particular play area in IFILD. The business rate equalisation reserve is a reserve that's been set up to smooth over the variations that the council gets in business rates from year to year. In some years, we collect a surplus compared to what was expected. In some years, we're in deficit compared to what was expected. By having that reserve, we're able to ensure there's a continuity of funding that doesn't mean we have to cut and uh, boost services uh, with whatever happens to be going on within that year. Consequently, this additional funded money is being put aside to help smooth over forthcoming years. Uh, as this report has also been to the Overeem Scrutiny Commission, I would like to bring in councillors here in Rana to feedback from their uh, discussions. Thank you, Chair. So the comments and the recommendations are the Commission consider report FIN 500 of the Head of Corporate Finance. During the discussion with the Head of Corporate Finance and Chief Ac Accountant, councillors made the following comments. Acknowledgement that the report documented the financial viability of the council, particularly as a result of COVID-19. Recognition, recognition that the flood program has been repertized, allowing for Tilgay Lake, Lake Bank, Erosion Bank, Erosion Works to commence ahead of schedule. Confirmation that the under or overspend and slippage on the HRA improvement works has been listed as a whole program of works as opposed to being broken down on individual projects. It was commented that further breakdown would be beneficial. Explanation sought and obtained on the reserves for expenditure in Tilgay Park and Nature Centre as part of the five year investment plan. Acknowledgement that revenue implications needed to be taken into account for new properties to avoid overspend. Clarification sought and obtained on the details provided within expenditures. General support for the report. However, it was queried whether the S106 money in 8.15 referred to the e-host playing fields in IFIL as documented in December 2013 Cabinet report or e or e-host road play area as set out of recommendation in 2.2b, which is in West Green. It was, it was requested Cabinet clarify the arrangements for the S106 funding, given the inconsistencies. So it's, it's been resolved that the Commission notes a report and request that the views expressed during the debate are fed back to the Cabinet through the Commission's comment sheet by requested Cabinet clarify the arrangements for the S106 funding. So one of the councillors was wondering which playing field it was. So it, had, it has been subsequently been confirmed the site is Ewhurst playing field, play area in Ifield. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, right, before I hand over to the Cabinet, um, because uh, the Cabinet is a committee of the Council, any councillor is entitled to come along and speak on an item if they wish to do so, so long as it's been agreed by the Chair in advance. Uh, councillor Duncan Crow, who is the Leader of the Opposition on the Council, has asked to speak on this uh, and one other item. So I'll hand over to Duncan uh, to enlighten us. Um, thank you and, um, and good evening, Leader and, and, and Cabinet. It's really good to um, uh, to see and hear from you in the first time in in over three months and also that I really welcome the first time for me to um, provide some public scrutiny at a meeting for the first time since March 11th which was the previous um, cabinet. Now this report we should remember of course goes up to the last quarter of the last financial year up to the 31st of March and we know that um, Covid started increasingly having an impact during March and especially during the last two weeks so its full implications are certainly not uh, reflected in this book before and the leader is right that um, uh, it, it will be reflected in, in future um, reports. I'd just like to um, attract the cabinet's attention to page uh, 33 in the in the papers at the top of the page um, and just three points from here that I'd like to um, just just comment on. Um, under 5.21 it says that the savings of 26,000 from the council local elections. 
although I would have thought it would have been a bit more than that, um, the cancellation, but perhaps it's because it was quite late in the day, I don't know. Um, a bit of clarity on that might be um, helpful. And interestingly, uh, two paragraphs below that, it mentions that um, additional savings of £42,000 have been achieved from uh, town hall business rates assessment due to demolition of parts of the, um, the, the the building and perhaps I could almost flippantly say maybe uh, the cabinet should encourage the demolition of a bit more possibly to try and save a little bit more uh, money in the in the short term and then under uh, paragraph 5.23 um, it mentions that um, the expected decrease of poor health services due to uncertainty around Brexit did not materialise which has resulted in unplanned income of £37,000. Well, well, that is great news to hear. And of course, it perhaps goes to show that actually some of the, um, the scaremongering around Brexit was perhaps uh, um, without um, foundation. But certainly going forward, the council has rightly got a lot more to worry about than uh, the Brexit, quite frankly, given the COVID um, restrictions. The, the leaders mentioned a figure of um, £4 million, which is... Um, it's, that's a new figure for me. I would be interested to see a, a, a breakdown of how that has been um, a, arrived at. But certainly some very difficult decisions are going to have to be taken um, going forward because it's not just this council, it's the entire it's the entire local government across the country and of course the national government as well that, and indeed households that are going to be having uh, to make difficult decisions over the next few um, months. So we in the Conservative group are very willing to support the administration in trying to help Look at the budget. Um, I very much welcome that there is going to be a member day in July that's going to be um, bringing us up to date as to where we are with uh, options for next year's um, budget. I would add that I think perhaps the budget advisory group is a bit past its sell by date and doesn't really provide anything useful anymore. But certainly members from my group were very interested to help um, contribute to the debate and to see what we can do as a council to, um, to, to balance the books and to provide good services, which we all want to do. Thank you. OK, uh, before I open up to the cabinet to speak, I'll respond on one or two of those points. Um, the first is the question in relation to savings from local election. Uh, to begin with, it's worth noticing, noticing that these are not solely local elections for this council. They're also police and crime commissioner elections. Consequently, they're half the costs or what they'd usually be to put on for the local authority. But a number of these savings are apparently being produced in the new year. Uh, as the financial, uh, as most of the election period itself would have been carried out in that new financial year. Um, in terms of the uh, reduction in terms of business rates on the town hall, um, of course, the rest of the town hall will be going at some stage, but by that point, we'll have a new town hall, uh, which will have its own business rates liabilities uh, that we'll be having to deal with. Uh, unfortunately, no one get out of business rates, even uh, the council itself. Uh, and on the port health uh, side of things, it's worth bearing in mind the last budget was produced a prime minister ago. Um, at which time there was a very real possibility of a no deal for exit, some of which was being advocated for by local representatives, uh, at which time we might have been in a very different position to where we are at. But it's always good to save money and to still have food coming into the country, uh, which is what their role is to assess. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, that we've managed to achieve that particular saving. Uh, we will, of course, be engaging with members as we try to resolve not just this year's budget deficit, but due to the ongoing impact on our economic circumstance and consequently the business rates the council collects, the ongoing savings that are going to have to be made of the order of about £2 million a year, which is one in every £7 the council spends in order to deal with the current financial situation we've been put into. That would be a debate not only for members, though. I think we need to ensure the public are fully involved in the conversation around how services are provided in the future. Um, I've had an indication from Councillor Peter Smith that he would like to speak next. So if I hand over to him. Um... Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I very much welcome this report and particularly the positive outcome of £245,000 um, less spend than the budget. It's a shame my own portfolio has for once returned a, a variance at the end of the year which was underperforming but that's because we've seen a fall off in planning applications given the, uh, the current situation. Um, I also note that this is, I think, the fifth year consecutively where we've had a positive budget from this administration, where we've been in positive uh, ground or break even, while at the same time continuing to deliver 
on our manifesto promises. And I think that it's not every council that can say that. Um, finally, it's also good to see that we're, we're starting the COVID crisis scenarios from a strong point. So we've had a well-run, well-managed council, um, which at least puts us in a good stead to, um, to, to start dealing with this four million pounds shortfall that we see coming down the pipe. I also second the report recommendations. Uh, would anyone else like to speak in this report? I've... Okay, apparently we're back to the hand waving as a method. Uh, Chris, if you uh, Mullins, if you'd like to speak now. Yeah, you're only back to the hand waving because you haven't got a hand. We normally have a hand on this little line up here, and it's much much better. Can we, Chris, get the hand back? Um, I, I was too was pleased to see that. I mean, although um, well-being did come out a little under, um, you know, um, uh, I, I I think that. What we do is an excellent service to the people of Crawley. I remain um, quite worried about the future from for, for the portfolio at the moment because the well-being balance in it is so important to the people of Crawley. Um, and as we head into financial difficulties, um, I do hope that we can find a way of keeping all these services up and running and 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 meeting the needs of Crawley residents. It's going to be tough times, difficult times, and it's no good pretending um, that it isn't. Um, I, on the Ewhurst uh, playing fields, I was pleased to see that. I do or have been to late, we closed them, frequented the Ewhurst playing fields quite a lot. And it's very, very popular with children and a very popular little centre. So um, it's good to see these. We've got some more Bay areas that we still need to consider refurbishing, um, some of them for safety reasons, and I hope that we'll be able to go ahead with those. But this time, you know, now with the COVID-19, it's gonna be very difficult for this council, and we can only um, try and pull together on it and, and, and go through the discussions that we need to go through to see how important um, some of the service elements that we provide are. And so be prepared for a lot of arguments from me. OK, um, I've got uh, Councillor Gorinda, uh, if you'd like to kick off next. Yes, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'd just like to really echo what Councillor Smith was saying about how we approach this uh, crisis from quite a, a solid financial position. Um, and how we've been delivering balanced budgets over the last few years. Um, but I do think it's really important to stress the impact that COVID-19 has been having on our finances. Um, and the, the budget gap you mentioned earlier is really concerning. And I just wondered if you could say a bit more about that and about the relatively small amount of support that has come forward from the government and where we'd like to see things going forward. And I will answer that after uh, Ian. Thank, thank you, Peter. Um, well, first of all, I, I think it's a good time to say that I think that local government, I, I know we're talking about the quarter four budget monitoring report, but as the conversation's expanded, I think we can say that local government has played a heroic role in uh, the coronavirus uh, crisis. And I think, you know, it's been uh, a terrible time for a lot of people um, and obviously we're going to have to make some you know tough decisions and I noticed there was a report today uh, in, in the national press that apparently eight out of ten uh, councils could be facing bankruptcy in the future and uh, I, I just just hope that we're not one of them and I'd also like to agree with Chris because some of the things which the council provides in this town would not be provided by anybody else. I'm thinking of things like the Hawth and K2 and various other things. So we have to not just defend the council in our decisions, we also have to defend the town. And I'm sure we'll do our best to do that. Okay, well, coming back to see the points that Grinda raised. 
Um, the, the council, since uh, I think about peak spend was I think in about 20, 2006, at which time the council had a net revenue uh, expenditure of about 27 million pounds. Today, the council has uh, a net revenue expenditure of about 14 million, which is the result of that prolonged period of cuts over the period since. Uh, that's the same budget as when I became council leader back in 2014 uh, with the new Labour administration, at which time we decided we were going to focus purely on trying to make up the difference between government's cuts to our budget uh, and what we would need to maintain services. And that's been achieved largely through a very hard programme of work to ensure that we're getting the most out of the council's assets um, in terms of ensuring that facilities like Tilgate Park are used effectively, uh, to do things like rebuilding the new uh, the town hall to be a more efficient building with commercial space through buying up more commercial space elsewhere and ensuring that existing uh, resources like the shop units on council parade pay the market rent for their units all of which has enabled us to keep our heads above water and to continue providing services at the rate at which people expect them to be provided the problem for us now is that the sudden impact of covid means that we are no longer uh, having the sort of prolonged period of time that we have to generate the money we would usually do. All the different ideas for generating new money have essentially been used up at this point and it comes at a point when the council is really at its lowest in terms of revenues available and opportunities for generating new revenues. So the possibility of trying to find out of nowhere uh, two million pounds a year to try and keep providing services, there's simply no way you can go. You're not going to find that behind the couch. Um, the realities in terms of the spending we've had to do while we've been dealing with the crisis is that we were promised uh, in March uh, that if we spent money, we'd have it compensated by the government if it was based on dealing with the emergency. And in that time, we've ensured that no one has to go without food, no one has to go without medicine, that the council was in a position to try and keep people safe by protecting facilities and limiting uh, public interaction. Uh, and it has done all those things uh, to a very high level. Uh, and when it came time to ask the government to do their duty and honour their word, uh, that money was not to be found. So we now find that the taxpayer is again having to compensate for the lack of the government living up to its promises. A good example of this around the homeless funding announced today, £105 million announced uh, to provide homeless uh, people with uh, housing uh, after the COVID-19 crisis or rather throughout the course of it. At the start of the crisis, we were given £24,000 to provide that uh, homeless uh, provision. Instead, our, the total bill per week was £22,000, which means that after 13 weeks, if you prorate the money the government's talking about, even with £105 million, local government is still worse off in terms of what they've already spent on homeless provision uh, than they were before, and they're clearly not in a position to continue funding that indefinitely. The government is required really to pump in about six billion pounds to make up for what we've lost, not the hundred million pounds here and there that they talk about. So the end result for people is going to be seeing that services are reduced. And in many cases where they haven't worked so hard to make up the money, where they've just resorted to cuts in past years, that's where the, the councils which are now considering having to have to close, was rather than opting to grow their budget, they opted to cut when times were not as hard as they, they needed to be. Those are the councils that are now at risk of going under. We're not at risk of going under. We have money. We have got a cash flow problem because under the way business rates are collected, and it's worth bearing in mind that out of £120 million worth of business rates, Quiddy Warra Council only gets to keep about 4% of that. So when we collect in all the business rates, we're required to give out the central government and to West Sussex County Council the majority portion of those business rates. With businesses not currently functioning and many of them struggling to make payments, the amount being collected is far, far lower than it usually would be with the end result being that the council is at the point of actually having to pay out more at the moment uh, in business rate funding to the government to West Sussex, because it's based on a projection that's then tallied up at the end of the year. More money is being paid out by this council in business rates than it's getting in. The entire financial system for councils is fundamentally broken. Um, the reality in Crawley is that we will survive this, but only because of the decisions that have been taken over the last six years to grow uh, our income rather than just cut services. But it is going to be at a much more reduced level than we've been able to provide services in the past. And there is nothing that I can see to avoid that. Does anyone else wish to have anything to say on this item? 
No, in that case, can I call upon Chris Pedlow to do the vote? Councillor Irvine, please confirm your vote for the recommendations on page 31 of the agenda. Four. Councillor Lamb, your vote, please. Four. Councillor Johans. Four. Councillor Mullins. One, two, three, four. Councillor Peter Smith. Uh, for the recommendations. Chair, that was a unanimous vote in favour and it's a grip and it's passed. Fantastic. Which brings us on to agenda item number five, which is the forward programme of key procurements. Over the course of the year, while we as a local authority do our absolute best to try and keep things in-house as it tends to produce the best outcomes the lowest price for local residents. Uh, we are required to still procure a number of things which would be impractical to provide in-house. Uh, the decisions coming up over the course of the next year are disabled adaptations to quality homes, unified telecoms, temp agency staff, building repairs and maintenance, and district heat network operation maintenance, metering and billing. As a result, we have developed a forward programme of key procurements so that people can see the issues which are coming forward and provide transparency in the process. The report for you is to create, uh, is to sign off on that forward plan and to provide us with the ability to kick off those procurements for the forthcoming year. This report has also been to, uh, no it hasn't, I don't think it has been to the Urban Scrutiny Commission actually. I'll just double check their agenda. Oh no it has, my mistake, sorry. So in that case I will hand over to Councillor Rana uh, who will take us through the, uh, through the forward programme. Thank you, Chair. The comments and the recommendations for this item are as follows. During the discussion with the Head of Corporate Finance and, Pro and Procurement Manager, councillors made the following comments. Recognition that the council's procurement is governed by the EU Public Procurement Directives and the Public Contracts Regulations 2015 and Council's Procurement Code Confirmation that when the UK leaves the EU, advertising may change, but the EU public procurement directives were enshrined in UK law. Acknowledgement that the process will promote greater, greater transparency and awareness of key pro procurement projects. Internal stakeholders would input into the process at an earlier stage and the organisations could manage resources more effectively. Confirmation was provided regarding the delegation process. Recognition that after the award of contracts, there was involvement and consultation with the relevant cabinet member as posed in recommendation 2.2c. It was felt that, uh, that this engagement should also be included in recommendation 2.2b at the award of contract stage so as to further enhance the greater transparency and involvement. It was subsequently recommended, recommended that recommendation 2.2b be amended to include consultation with an appropriate cabinet member. Following an, an anonymous vote, it was agreed that the cabinet be, re, cabinet be requested to consider the addition and recommendation 2.2b would now read, delegate authority to the leader of the council in consultation with the appropriate cabinet member. The relevant head of service and head of legal democracy and HR to approve the award of the contract following an appropriate procurement process. So the matter was resolved that Commission notes the report and request that the views expressed during the debate are fed back to the Cabinet through the Commission's comment sheet and request Cabinet to consider the proposed amendment to recommendation 2.2b above. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I have to say I'm minded to accept that, rec uh, that recommendation. Uh, of it. I don't see any reason why the relevant Cabinet member couldn't be uh, consulted and bearing in mind that as it currently stands I'm the only one who gets consulted. I don't think there'd be any uh, anyone in cabinet saying they'd rather not. 
Um, is there anyone else who wants to say anything on this? Either on the amendment or on the report as a whole? I think anything procurement related tends to be rather dry, unfortunately. Can I, can I say, Chair, that I agree with the amendment? It makes sense to me and I support it. Um, other members are indicating their agreement, uh, in which case, could I suggest to uh, Chris Pedlow that we, we move this to a vote? Uh, initially on the, oh, we disagree that the amendment is, is agreed uh, first. Agreed. 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 Right, that's all four members. In which case, can we formally move to a vote on the recommendation? Uh, I, I, I move the recommendation, Chair. Is that what you want? <laughs> Go up four. <laughs> Councillor Lamb, please confirm your vote on the rec amended recommendation. Four. Councillor Jahans, please confirm your vote on the amended recommendation. Four, please. Councillor Mullins. Four. And Councillor Peter Smith. For the amended recommendation. Chair, that was a unanimous vote by all cabinet to, to support the amended recommendation. Fantastic. Well, now I get to give everyone a gift, which is me shutting up for a bit, uh, because the next report is on electric vehicle charging infrastructure network. And because this is the first item tonight that doesn't fall within the leader's portfolio, but it falls instead into the portfolio of the Environmental Services and Sustainability Cabinet member, uh, can I hand over to uh, Gorinda to take us through the report? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say about this is that our commitment to tackling the climate emergency and improving air quality is what really underpins this report, as well as the report we'll be discussing shortly on our local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. But firstly, just to give some context around this report, uh, members will know that in December, West Sussex adopted an electric vehicle strategy, and this set out a vision for increasing the take up of electric vehicles. It sets a target for 70% of new cars in the county to be electric by 2030. So in order to facilitate this and encourage this transition, we need to roll out renewable energy charging points, but particularly for those residents who don't have access to off-road parking. In the report itself, you'll see that one of the main barriers to this increased take up of electric vehicles is a lack of charging infrastructure. 30% of households in Crawley don't actually have off-road parking, so they would find it quite difficult to make the switch to electric vehicles as they simply don't have the, uh, the place to charge their cars close by to their homes. So these proposals in the report basically aim to try and address this issue. So we've been invited to partner with West Sussex to nominate sites that we own to be included as part of a countywide electric vehicle charging network. Uh, you'll see a list of sites on the last page in Appendix 1 of the sites that we're putting forward. Uh, and it's worth clarifying that this list is by no means definitive and other CBC owned land could be put forward for consideration too. Uh, it's also important to note that West Sussex are putting forward all of highways land. So this includes every single road in Crawley and across the county. The network itself will be delivered by a concessionary contract, which West Sussex will be procuring. And one of the major benefits of this is that there will be no maintenance or liabilities or costs for us, something which will be particularly significant considering our financial position uh, post COVID. Uh, finally, just going back to the climate emergency, I think it's again really important to stress that this work is absolutely integral um, things that we need to undertake um, in response to our climate emergency declaration, which we passed last year. We know transport contributes around a third or over a third of carbon emissions across Crawley. So to meet our climate targets, we really need to work as quickly as we can 
to enable residents to switch to lower emission vehicles. And it also has the, the added benefit of improving our air quality too, something really important at a time where before COVID struck air quality in some parts of our borough were getting significantly worse. Um, so on that note, the recommendation is, is to approve for us to take part in this scheme. Thank you very much. Brilliant, I've had two indications so far. I'll go first to Peter uh, to, to talk. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank Arinda for bringing this report forwards. I think it's exactly the right thing to be doing and to be doing it in a comprehensive way like this is very important to the town. Um, we've already made changes to the consultation local plan to encourage developments to include more support for electric vehicles. And if we're to have a serious attempt at combating climate change and encouraging people to change their modes of transport, we need to develop, deliver the infrastructure to support that. Um, I'm also particularly pleased to see a county-wide initiative um, and, and really not waiting till it's very late in the day. They're bringing it forward quite early on, I think, and I, I very much commend them for doing that. And I'm pleased that, that we are getting the opportunity to, to get in on this deal, which I think will be a benefit for the council and most importantly for the residents. So I will certainly be supporting this recommendation and thank you, Clorinda, for bringing it forwards. I need to apologise now. I forgot to bring in um, Tahira to, to give us the OSC's uh, view on this report. Tahira, would you would you take us through OSC's uh, evaluation of it? Thank you, Peter. We had a very interesting debate on it, and the comments and the recommendation, recommendations were during the discussion with a cabinet member for environmental services and sustainability head of economy and planning and the sustainability manager, the following comments were made. Reduced emissions were welcomed, but it was noted that the vehicle batteries had a finite lifetime and could not be recycled. However, there were second uses for batteries like energy storage. There was a discussion about hydrogen vehicles as an alternative to EVs. It was noted that there was a small number of hydrogen vehicles on the market, but they were still very ex expensive and the refilling infrastructure was not yet widespread and was technically cha challenging. It was noted that throughout the programme of work, the additional pressure on the existing power infra infrastructure should be considered. Recognition that the list of sites was not definitive Definitive, sorry, or confirmed, and was also addition to those proposed by West Sussex County Council. There was currently an option to recommend sites on the West Sussex County Council website. And also, while supportive of the report, there was concern raised uh, surrounding the number of spaces and potential concentration of the sites, which may may overwhelm some areas. Consultation with ward members would be welcomed in order to gain an understanding of the local area during any feasibility studies. Clarification was provided on fast and rapid charge points together with further information on the main types of charging infrastructure. It was noted that the procurement would be managed by West Sussex County Council and further discussion took place surrounding the real living wage. Acknowledgement that, that the issue of parking remained throughout the town and enforcement could take place through the usual channels for penalty uses of electric vehicle charging points. So the matter was resolved that Commission notes the report and requests that the views expressed, expressed during the debate are fed back to the Cabinet through the Commission's comment sheet. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think there's a lot of valuable information about that, particularly around ensuring that we consult uh, with those uh, on the council who represent the areas that are likely to be affected. Of course, this is only the initial stage uh, of this process. We don't have to go with uh, whoever is, is procured by the county, uh, but at this stage it gets us in to have that opportunity to be part of this uh, county-wide network. And there are one or two areas where you know, we, there are, we, we may well disagree with the county on these things and may need to negotiate part of that process. 
uh, but certainly ward member uh, involvement, I think, is going to be crucial to ensuring that the views of the community are fully heard in this. Um, right, is there anyone who wishes to speak on this? Sorry, Chris, I forgot you, you'd weighed earlier. Yeah, no, I did, yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, um, as a, a re-emerged uh, bike rider, I just put a bike rack on my bike today. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm um, I'm, I'm still keen to see this from an environmental point of view. I mean, it's very, very important. My major concern is that I don't believe that the 30% figure can be accurate. When you know Crawley, 30% um, who could not have charges at home seems very low to me. If I go down Rother Crescent and see some of the houses that are laid way back on that whole long road, I mean, most of those houses won't be able to put a charge point in. Um, and then if I look at the list, they're all in sort of centre places like Gossip Screen Parade or Gossip Screen Community Centre and so on. Um, and we have lots of roads deep into residential areas and people are not really going to want to leave their cars overnight um, that remote from their homes. So I, I see this as a kickoff. I would support it, absolutely, because it's got to happen. But I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's finite at all. Um, it's, it's it's getting them in. The other concern I, I do have, and I don't know whether the council is in any position to write to the government over it or, or make an input, but the price of cars, electric cars, is so expensive. And the, the schemes for trading your old diesel in or whatever you've got are not very good. And for all lots of ordinary people on ordinary wages, um, getting some sort of electric or even a hybrid car is way out of their reach. They just are not going to be able to afford it. Um, and so uh, the problem's going to be there for a long, long time. Now, if the government's serious about moving rapidly um, to doing something uh, about the environment, and it's been much better since uh, shutdown, actually. I live near Gatwick Airport um, or in Langley Green, north of it. Um, or not north of the airport, but north of Crawley. Um, I, I, I just have noticed the difference and and it's been great improvements. But I do support the use of environmentally friendly cars. And I was reading in the paper today that they've actually made a hydrogen aeroplane now um, and that can actually fly for a long, long time, um, charging up or driving its electric motor. So there's lots of innovations coming along, but they're very, all very, very expensive. We all live on an economy, uh, low wages. Um, how do you deal with that uh, without penalising people who actually need to be able to get around? And the last thing that I wanted to say was this equipment, which is laid out in sometimes remote places. Um, you know, for example, I've got one in Dorman's Park in Gossip Screen, which what might not be very visible to an awful lot of people. I mean, OK, it's OK to put it there, but how robust is the equipment? Will it be vulnerable to vandalism if we talk to them about um, what actually happens if if they if it gets vandalised and people can't charge their vehicles up, presuming they've got one? So um, I think we ought to be assured about the nature of the equipment itself. I do agree that the first tranche of this, we should do a deal with the county council. It makes sense. But um, Ongoing, I think we've really got to look at what our localities are like, and I do question the 30% figure. Before I bring in Councillor Johns to summarise, uh, does anyone else want to say anything? No, great. Uh, Gorinda, over to you. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Chris, for those interesting points. Uh, the 30% figure is something uh, we have been looking into. Um, and I've been informed that it's a figure we received from county. Uh, however, we are looking to try and to ascertain a more accurate figure from for that. Um, so I'll keep you updated on what we receive on, on that. And as you say, if it if you believe that is uh, quite a lower and a conservative estimate of the percentage of people who do not have um, off road parking, then I think that reinforces the point of how imperative it is that we roll out this kind of infrastructure to ensure people can then make the switch towards electric vehicles as they will then have somewhere to charge their cars. Um, on your point about the list itself, um, as I mentioned, it's not a definitive list and those are sites that have only been 
identified on CBC land. Uh, West Sussex have put forward all of highway, so that includes every single street within Crawley. So there will be many more. Um, uh, may, sorry about that. Uh, there'll be many more streets that will be um, part of the final network within Crawley. And also just to say that um, whoever the supplier is, there will be a, a feasibility study to ensure that the sites um, that have been identified, they are feasible for a delivery of this kind of network. And that will undertake things like cost implications and whether it's even viable to implement the connections and the cables underground to reach the, the grid to provide the electricity. Um, I, I fully take your point about the price of electric vehicles. I know they can be expensive. I know the government do have um, some kind of low emission vehicles plug-in grant. I think it's about £3,000 maximum. But you know, it would be great if they were cheaper to, to help people make the shift much easier uh, for them. Um, and your final point was on the, uh, the nature of the equipment itself. Um, again, that's something we can look into. And if um, whoever the suppliers is, I'm sure we can receive some reassurances uh, from them about how robust the equipment actually is. Um, so yeah, thank you. Chris, was there something you wanted to add to that? One, two, three. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Right. Okay, in that case, uh, Chris Pedlow, could you take us through the vote? Councillor so, Irvine, please confirm your vote on the recommendations on page 53 and 54. Four. Councillor Lamb. Four. Councillor Johans. Four. Councillor Mullins. Four. And Councillor Smith. For the recommendations. Chair, that was a unanimous vote, all in favour of the recommendations. Fantastic. Uh, the next one is, is back to Grinda <coughs> with uh, local cycling and walking infrastructure plans for those people who can't afford an electric car, I guess. Uh, and I'll hand over to Grinda to introduce the report. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is our local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. And it actually comes at quite a timely moment with so many more people walking and, and cycling as we've been in lockdown. So I really hope this receives some good traction and, and positive engagement from, from members and, and residents alike. Uh, again, this feeds into our climate emergency work and hopefully can move towards helping to embed some of the positive modal shifts we've seen recently where people have been taking up these more sustainable forms of, of transport. Um, it's basically a, a costed plan which identifies some of the key cycle and walking routes in the town. But most importantly, what it does is it proposes physical infrastructure improvements in specific areas to create safer and more attractive and more accessible routes to encourage more people to cycle and walk. And some of these improvements could be anything from uh, widening footpaths and cycleways to refurbishing paths and even improving crossings and connections. All this information that we've we've put together, we'll, we'll then hope to, to use it to attract some funding and investment, which could come from the likes of the Department for Transport, uh, the Towns Fund or even direct developer investment. Uh, there's a section in the report which I found really interesting um, and you'll see that it shows that Crawley's levels of walking and cycling are actually below national and county averages. Uh, when I thought about this, I found it quite surprising and concerning, especially when we consider the fact that Crawley really has some of the raw ingredients to be an ideal place for active travel. For example, we have quite flat terrain and many shops and places of work are all within walking and cycling distance from people's homes. But if you dig a, dip, dig a bit deeper into the report, you'll see that some of the reasons for this, for the low rates of walking and cycling is to do with safety and how we have quite busy roads and often quite fast traffic. 
There's also poor connectivity of the routes themselves and the infrastructure itself isn't in particularly great shape. Uh, people have often complained about having insufficient space on their cycling paths and walkways and often worry about having collisions with one another. Uh, so just to sum up, the, the LSWIP itself it, the aims to improve our infrastructure and basically get more people cycling and walking. Uh, this will also help us to meet the Department for Transport's target to double cycling by 2025 and generally increase walking trips uh, during that time. Our aim for this uh, document now is to go out for consultation before the end of June and we hope it will be for an extended period of time uh, which will go into the autumn to allow enough time for a thorough consultation and look forward to, to hearing as many views as possible from residents and members. So I'd encourage you all to, to take a look and take part in the consultation. Thank you. Tahira, what did the OSC have to say about, uh, about this proposal? Thank you, Peter. Actually, we had a lot to say. Actually, this was another excellent report by Gurinder and we really had a very, very interesting debate. So during the discussion with the Cabinet Member for Environmental Services and Sustainability, Head of Economy and Planning and the Sustainability Manager, the following comments were made. Officers were commended on a detailed and interesting report. Recognition that Crawley's cycling and walking numbers were below the county average, mainly due to safety, busy roads and connectivity. It was noted that there was need to instill public confidence in cycling and walking through separate space for cycling lanes, bike security and encouraging active travel. Acknowledgement that the five sets of cycle counters were in place to evaluate cycle trips. Whilst not monitoring speed, it was proposed that all newly developed cycle routes would include a plan for monitoring and evaluating their use and effectiveness. General support for the report and to encourage access through the town. However, those who are not able to easily travel should not be disadvantaged by the infrastructure established. There needed to be a balance. Concern was raised regarding some of the traffic management plans proposed, uh, propo proposed within the appendices. It was noted that there may have been a detrimental effect on other users. It was therefore suggested that it would be beneficial that ward and county councillors were included in the consultation of any particular scheme. And the matter was resolved that Commission notes the report and request that the views expressed during the debate are fed back to the Cabinet through the Commission's comment sheet. Thank you, Chair, and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Uh, I think again, you know, certainly it's very valid to ask for further consultation around uh, this with ward members and as ever they will be included uh, within the process. Um, I've had an indication from Chris that he'd like to speak. So over to Chris. Oh, I keep turning it on and off. Hang on. <laughs> Is it on there? <laughs> um, I, I, I was really pleased to see this because all my life I was a cyclist. Um, and I used to cycle everywhere. It's a big part of my life until I had a bad accident and I got hit by a car. And uh, and and then it's taken me all this time, many, many years um, to get back on a cycle. I didn't think actually that I ever would, but um, I've I've been persevering with it down Cherry Lane and um, and I'm getting quite proficient again now, which is, is quite good. So. But I mean, the safety element is very, very important. I mean, if you're in a, on a cycle and you're riding somewhere and there's lorries and buses, cars going too fast, um, coming up behind you, it, it can be terrifying. And and bikes can wobble, um, you know, that just happens. And, you know, and these people, you know, maybe run into to these uh, bikes and, cause an accident. So, I mean, I just think that I can understand why people around Crawley might be reluctant to cycle because our roads are very congested a lot of the time and, and, and certainly on some of the roads, people drive at great speeds, um, which, and it's not, it isn't, you don't always feel safe. 
And so uh, putting a small little metal frame on the road next to a lorry or a bus is not really a good idea if you think about it. You wouldn't do it if you had any common sense. And uh, and yet, you know, we're encouraging people to cycle. So I, I want to see this because it's absolutely vital that we go forward and we make a good network infrastructure in this town. But I'd like also to see it linked to other towns, um, whether you feel like you should go to those towns or not. Some people might want to. Um, so, I mean, when you look around, there's towards Mid-Sussex, there's towards Horsham, it's towards the north, towards Hawley and as East Grinstead. It should be possible to visit those towns on a cycle safely. And I don't think that's always the case in, in, in what I've outlined. So, I mean, that might be a further stage in these proposals. So I do welcome these proposals, but I don't see it as the complete and completed picture. Um, so I will be supporting uh, the recommendations and hope we move on it as, as rapidly as we can do. I've had two indications that we want to speak, but before that, can I bring in Duncan Crow? Thank you, I've been unmuted. Um, no, thank you, Leader, for um, bringing me um, in. As strongly, the last but one item, you spent a long time talking about the finances and the, the difficulties of the council um, going forward. And I did think that you used road tinted uh, spectacles, but actually I think you need those spectacles to, to look at some of the plans here because uh, they're very, very small and there's a lot of intricate detail in there that I think will, um, will be missed in a um, public uh, consultation. Um, what I think the public will take from this agenda item is that the council are proposing to, to spend up to £23.5 million pounds of money on cycling improvement and not a penny on neighbourhood parking improvements. And the, the administration keeps telling us that they're not the highway authority when it comes to problems raised about neighbourhood parking. And yet, this agenda item says to me that the administration is trying to act like the, uh, the highway authority, given that it wants to make substantial changes to a lot of our highway infrastructure. Now, don't get me wrong, I do support improvements to walking and cycling facilities, but there needs to be a balance. And we do not, we should not be penalising motorists. And that, unfortunately, is what I see in a lot of these these plans. Now, if you have a look at page 77 in the report under the, the vision, um, I just want to highlight three bullet points. And the first one says that uh, walking and cycling become the natural first choice for assessing, assessing what we need for improved urban design, which prioritises this sort of active travel over motor vehicles. But what that actually means is that it's going to be penalising uh, motorists, making life more difficult for them. In some cases, it's going to mean greater emissions and indeed greater mileage because they're going to be slowing down to go over raised uh, tables and then having to uh, speed up again rather than having a smooth um, journey. In other cases, it will be because uh, routes have been uh, closed off and a longer distance to be uh, covered. The one, two, three, four, the, um, the fifth bullet point under the vision says that land is freed up for new homes, new business and other uses as demand for car parking goes down. Well, I'm sorry, but this is this is delusional, quite frankly. Demand for car parking will not go down. What the best we can hope to achieve is to limit the growth of the need for car parking. And that is something that is, is realistic. And then finally, the um, just under the bullet point under the vision, it says a shift in how we get around, which reduces demand for car use, means Crawley's taking action on the climate emergency and improved air quality by cutting pollution and carbon emissions. I just covered that point. So my my apologies. The one I did want to cover was uh, where it says um, that yeah, the land is freed up. I've covered that one. So um, this to so page 80 in the report, I do have concerns about the, the governance of this, which there's a few paragraphs on this, but it's not that um, clear to me. It seems to be sort of more officer um, 
governance rather than uh, the members. And while county council officers have been involved, I see very little input uh, or opportunity for county council members who quite frankly should be having quite a big input into, into these um, uh, plans and also ought to be having to have some sort of meaningful vote on them as, as well. Now, I do welcome that there is a public consultation, but as I'd already sort of suggested, because the plans have so much detail in them, and it's actually quite hard to see, I don't think the public are gonna realize what's in this until it hits them. And just looking at my, my own patch, as an example, in Furnace Green, we've got a proposal for raised tables on Waterlee and Coltash Road, which means that everybody who lives on those roads and east of those roads is gonna have to cross those raised tables every single time to get out of their estate in a car, just, to, just so that cyclists, the, the small number of cyclists that go, use that cycle path can have a greater um, priority and just to make it slightly more convenient for them on those um, occasions. And I think when residents get to see this, they're going to be quite concerned. We've got the same set of proposals in Tilgate as well for Shackleton Road and for, uh, for Drake Road. And I suspect when residents around there find out what's being proposed, they're not going to be very happy. It's all very well consulting with cycling groups, but actually we need to consult with, with the rest of Crawley as well. And I'm not, I'm not convinced that we will actively do this and we'll end up finding that a lot of people in Crawley won't know what's being proposed until um, un until it actually happens. So I am I'm concerned. I do think some of these plans are being drawn up in a in a, in a coffee table on a trendy bar in Islington rather than in the real world. So I look forward to some more member engagement. I think some of the plans do have value and uh, we can certainly um, take those forward. But even though it's a, a blueprint as I, as, I, as I read it, it's really hard to see what's actually going to end up happening. And it might be, oh, we might be told, oh, don't worry, this, a lot of this isn't actually going to happen, it's just an aspiration. But then we find it gets adopted into the local plan and then there's actually nothing that we can do to, to stop the worst elements of it. So my final words, I say, let's, have, let, let's move forward, but let's have some balance and let's have a meaningful engagement. Thank you. I mean, there's quite a lot to unpack there. Uh, you know, first of which is, Apparent belief that this is automatically going to come into to realisation. You know, first off, if it's a local plan, the local plan doesn't dictate how road usage actually develops. It's how the, you try to deal with the pressures that are put on it. And as you've outlined, or at least as people are aware, there is considerable congestion in the town. In fact, we have an area that covers um, air quality management area that covers the whole stretch from Three Bridges Station all the way up around Crawley Avenue on the basis that it's an area which is fundamentally toxic to people's lungs to be in due to the level of, of traffic congestion around those areas. Now, the idea that that's going to be resolved by putting more space in for cars is you know, unrealistic, uh, particularly when you bear in mind how much additional road space that would require. Um, I mean, to tackle the envelope calculations, the total number of parking spaces, um, which by the time that you know, the, 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 the road, the, the parking improvement scheme money ran out, I think there were at least 200 odd rows that were looking for um, uh, additional parking bays. Um, you know, the, 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 the cost of which was 30,000 a bay. Um, the total, you know, quantity of, of sort of alleviation that will provide would be very minimal when you compare it to getting a significant number of vehicles actually, uh, people off vehicles. I think it's the difference between, you know, either you can enable 600 odd motorists or alternatively you can enable thousands of additional. Uh, cyclists for additional uh, sort of amounts of sums but look this is not a set budget because we haven't got money in place to provide it it is important to have proposals in place for how you would deal with these things for when pots of money come up and we know this because the government within the last month has told us that we had 10 days to deliver plans around how we would take some growth proposals forward and one of the key constraints that we've had on that is that the county council repeatedly fails to plan ahead for what is needed in terms of the development of the town's infrastructure over time so yes, the Borough Council has, with this and a number of other areas, stepped in to try and provide a plan for it. But just as with parking, because we haven't got the money, we can't guarantee it delivers. What we can do now is say, here is the strategy for how we'll try and deliver that over time. Um, and contrary to what is suggested, the per capita car ownership in this town has dropped in the last two censuses. And it's very likely to have dropped again in the next one. Uh, the issue is the increasing number of people forced to live with their parents due to the, count the town's ongoing housing crisis built up over many years and which is certainly not being made uh, easier to deal with in the next local plan 
based on the increasing provisions, making it harder to deliver affordable housing. Uh, but were we in a position where we could enable people to live further away uh, or move out of areas which are currently congested, you would see the total level uh, of parking demand in those areas decline quite significantly, rather than having to have you know, three or four different adults living in the same household. Um, unfortunately, you know, I think you've got the entire problem here built back to front. Uh, but bearing in mind that you're, you know, along with everyone else has allegedly signed up to doing uh, the climate emergency, which certainly the word emergency usually to my mind brings flashing lights and alarms and you do whatever you can to try and save the situation. Um, we are actually trying to do what we can to try and limit the level of pollution in the town, not just for saving the planet, but because frankly, if you look at the cancers in Crawley based on air quality, uh, cars are one of the biggest sources of killing our residents. Right, with that over the mind, uh, can I hand over to Pete, uh, Ian uh, to speak next? Thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, first of all, I, I think it's um, good that we have the uh, positive support on this from the Cross Party Overview and Scrutiny Commission. It's always good to get their endorsement for what we're proposing. Um, secondly, I think like a lot of people, I am a practitioner of the mixed transport economy. Sometimes I cycle, sometimes I walk, sometimes I drive, sometimes I go by public transport. But I don't see this report as in any way being anti-car. What it is, is a way of enabling people who want to do so to cycle safely. Um, one thing I've noticed since uh, we, we've had lockdown is there are a lot more people cycling and a lot more people cycling on the roads. But there are also, I believe, a lot of people who would like to cycle who don't feel safe cycling on the roads and who can blame them. Um, I've had a massive email about of email correspondence about various uh, issues which I don't usually get contacted about, such as uh, motorbikes around Broadfield using Broadfield as a virtual race track with impunity. Um, cars parking on pavement so that uh, uh, people pushing uh, their, their children push chairs have to get off the pavement and into the road and go around all these things uh, or obstacles to people who want to have a different way of um, of getting around and uh, I, I think you know we're the 21st century and we should make it easier for people to make a choice of uh, the method of transport they want to they want to use. But I do have a question, and it's a question which has been asked to me by a lot of people who've been interested in this. And I would like the answer to be on the public record if possible. And the, answer, and the question is that having created this uh, cycling infrastructure, cycle paths and so on and so forth, who would then be responsible for the maintenance of that infrastructure? Uh, be before I bring in uh, Gorinda to answer that, can I ask Peter to, to raise his item? or give his uh, view. Thank you, Peter. Um, I don't think anyone would be surprised that I want to speak on this item as I've been campaigning to try to increase the take up of walking and cycling in Crawley for over 20 years now. Um, but I do want to start on a, on a more serious note and, and take this report seriously, unlike the leader of the opposition. Um, and and, and recognise firstly that the, the work on the Elswip was st first started by Councillor Garrett Thomas. It was something very dear to his heart and I know he'll be very, very pleased that Marinda has brought it forward and that we now have a very substantial and well worked out report in front of us. Now Crawley was the first um, borough or district in West Sussex to pick up the Elswip and, and to start doing it. It's a government initiative and it's it's required of all local authorities to produce one. Now this one has been produced and I followed it closely. It's been in pro produced in close consultation with West Sussex who are the highways authority as Councillor Crow says and, and the elsewhere goes to join the other county council district and borough elsewhere to form a a, a blueprint or an, a, a set of designs, provisional designs that, that work across the whole county. Um, in, in terms of Crawley, we, we've, as members will know, recently launched our 
new directions for Crawley, transport strategy for the overall transport strategy of the town, again with the provisional support of the County Council and working closely with the County Council as the Highways Authority. Uh, and both of these documents, the new directions for Crawley and the elsewhere, will form supplementary documentation to support the ideas and vision that we had for the town in the local plan. Now they're not proscriptive, but they are ambitious and visionary in order to inform detailed design, etc. as we go forward, as developers come forward with applications, etc. The tremendous benefit of the elsewhere is that it's, it, it's worked on in detail on a collection of routes that form a complete infrastructure and that they're, they're costed. They're costed for everything except for the design work, actually. Um, the, the cost figure is indicative and it is in no way a commitment on us to deliver it because it would be the responsibility of County Councillors, Highways Authority as the primary delivery of transport um, infrastructure to Crawley to fund it. Although, of course, having shovel ready plans is always a good thing in the modern world because we never know when we're going to get um, some support or help from central government, the coast to capital let, etc. And in that sense, our people will know, councillors will know for sure, we already have two cycle schemes coming forward on a funded basis that are in the elsewhere, but are also included in the Crawley Growth Programme. Um, the Eastern Gateway, is look, which is the scheme that works along the Boulevard, Cro College Road, and joins up with um, Southgate Avenue, the detailed designs have present, been presented to councillors and going out to the public um, and are potentially starting work in early September, led by the County Council who are, are going to be delivering that work. And, and there's more to come on that. Um, the, the second one is, is, is around, man, I know someone's driving past in the, on a motorbike by the sounds of it. Um, so, the, the whole point of putting these together is, is to, uh, to have a plan, have a vision, have in fact some positive designs to help us to secure, to secure funding. Now, if we go to page 77, it, it says at the top, we could see Crawley as a town where, now this is talking about a vision that is about to go out to consultation. So I think reading it out loud and saying that it's ridiculous and nonsense is a view that someone is entitled to hold themselves, but they should con contribute that to the consultancy. To, and, and I hope that by the time they do that, they will have thought carefully about their words and recognise that some of these things we've actually seen happening in our town over the course of the lockdown. Um, if you if, I think in every neighbourhood, and I've been cycling around the town during the lockdown, I'm taking my exercise, um, there's loads of families and kids and people out on bikes just getting around. Um, we have to make it safer for people to do that, uh, giving them a choice that, so that instead of taking the car to the park, they could cycle to the park, or instead of taking the car to work, they could cycle to work. There's nothing in this elsewhere that is preventing anybody using a car, nothing. And um, to, to suggest that it is, is completely wrong and um, should be withdrawn. The same goes for the amount, the estimated amount for the development of the elsewhere, of, of 23 million I think it is. It's not a plan for Crawley Borough Council to deliver, it's simply an estimate of the potential cost of delivering these schemes. Um, in terms of race tables, uh, Councillor Barrett brought that up at Scrutiny Commission on Monday. Um, I think we need to be very careful with, with, with these things and, and, and new, issuing knee-jerk responses to these. We've started to see raised tables being put in on the new cycleway along Ifield Avenue abutting Langley Green. They're there to remind cars, drivers and pedestrians and cyclists that they're entering a shared space, they're entering a 
residential neighborhood where people walk around, kids play, and they need to behave appropriately. Um, I don't think it inconveniences anyone in any great way, but each one will need to be looked at in turn when the detailed design comes along, when, when hopefully these schemes come forward. And we do have several places now in Crawley where we have those. We have some of them on the, the Worth Road scheme as well on the uh, eastern side of town. So I'm not going to go any more into all the details. Um, needless to say, I welcome this. I think it's fantastic that Crawley Borough Council is taking the lead in active travel, giving our residents alternative options, delivering potentially technical solutions that will help deal with the climate emergency, I know Garant's looking down on us and wishing us well, and I'm wishing Garinda well bringing this report forward. And I certainly will be supporting the recommendations and doing everything I can to make a lot of this come to reality. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak on this item? No. In that case, can I have... Oh, Garinda, do you want to sum up? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Um, that was a really nice uh, note to end it on, um, Peter Smith, um, talking about Garain. Uh, I know he was heavily involved with this and was a really keen cycler. So, you know, this is part of his legacy and I'm, I'm really proud to be able to take this forward and, and hopefully we can deliver this. Um, I am quite disappointed by the comments um, from the leader of the opposition, uh, especially how they contrasted from the quite helpful and constructive discussion we had um, at OSC uh, and I would say that the initiative itself is actually being coordinated countywide by West Sussex which he knows is the highway authority and we're responding to their lead on this uh, and also we're responding not only to that but to government policy which is which requires local authorities to bring forward their own local cycling walking infrastructure plans and the funding that will become available from the department for transport, as he mentioned about finances. Um, the bids to the department for transport related to the um, LSWIP are likely to be led by county, again, as is the highway authority, which we know. Um, so they will be considered by county members. Um, sorry, there was, a, there was quite a few points there. Um, there was mention about parking as well. I know we're still waiting to hear back from County about the road, road space audit proposals. Um, Ian, you had a question on the maintenance side of this. Um, my understanding is that since the routes will be on public highways, it will be responsibility of the highway authority to maintain. And that's alongside the rest of the road space for which they're responsible for. Um, in addition to that, I'd just like to say um, a final point on the consultation. Um, there was a point about consulting with the rest of Crawley. That's exactly what we're planning to do. Um, and there's a reason why we're going to have an extensive consultation that will take us up to the autumn. It's an extended consultation and I would invite all members, no matter your opinion on the LSWIP itself at this stage, to, to put forward your, your ideas and help us to develop the best possible plan that we can that is deliverable and helps to make Crawley a more safer a more attractive and more accessible place for people to walk and cycle. And let's not forget that this all feeds into a climate emergency declaration which we passed last year. Um, and I don't think anywhere else, anyone else would disagree with the fact that we need to take steps to reduce our carbon emissions. And this is a major way to do that. And I would just like to, to point to one statistic within the report, which was uh, based on a Manor Royal uh, Business Improvement District survey, where they found that about 50% of the workers live within a 30 minute cycle of Manor Royal. 50% live within 30, a 30 minute cycle of Manor Royal. They found only 3% cycle. If that's not evidence enough that we need to improve our infrastructure around here, especially considering the size of the town and especially considering the terrain of our town, then I don't know what is. So I'd be very grateful if everyone uh, votes in favour of this and, and works on the consultation. And again, as I said before, really looking forward to receiving representations from residents and from members alike 
in every ward to help us to to refine this. Thank you. OK, good attempt uh, it, that everyone has spoken and therefore doesn't want to say any more. Right, over to Chris to run the vote. Councillor Irvine, can you confirm your vote on the recommendations on page 63 of the agenda, please? Four. Councillor Lamb? Four. Councillor Jahans? Four. Councillor Mullins? Four. And finally, Councillor Peter Smith? I vote for these recommendations. Chair, there's a unanimous vote in support of the recommendations. Brilliant. Uh, the next item is the supplemental agenda. Uh, the council does have a supplemental agenda. It's the HRA budget for purchase of land or property. Uh, due to the nature of this, much as with the other reports uh, that is uh, relating to a financial issue, uh, this is being conducted in uh, in private. Uh, other councillors will be permitted to watch it. Unfortunately, the public and the press can't be at this particular stage. And consequently, the committee is asked to consider passing the following resolution. That under section 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public be excluded from the meeting for the following item of business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in part one of schedule 12A of the Act by virtue of the paragraph specified against the item. Can I take it that that is agreed? Agreed. Right. It doesn't seem agreed. 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 Brilliant. That's everyone, in which case, uh, thank you very much to everyone who's tuned in. Please do uh, come along next time. Please do attend a, a public meeting at some point. I think you might find it a bit more engaging, particularly if you can ask a question. And with that, I need to turn it off uh, from public view so that we can go on to have the discussion on these items.